The producer profile is a new section of the Looking Into Wine podcast. In this section, I'll be talking with winemakers about their wines and looking into the unique regional characteristics, their winemaking and viticultural techniques and how these elements affect their wines. What this wine producer used to enhance and adapt to their wine region and what to expect from the winery soon. Producer profile will be the release in between the main episodes. Now, let's talk about our first guest, Lance Moser, head winemaker of Chateau Shangu Moser in Nixinia, China. Lance specializes in Cabernet Sauvignon. He says that he has never seen such a small berries in his 35 years experience as a winemaker as in Ningxia. We talk about the region's climate, the influence of the nearby mountain ranges and how they bury the wines in the freezing cold winter and his unique white Cabernet Sauvignon. Hi, I'm Matthias Carpazza and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and wine making can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey looking into wine. Welcome today to Looking Into Wine. Today's guest is Lance Moser of Chateau Shangu Moser 15, Ningxia, China. Thank you very much for having me. So Lance, how, how did you arrive in China and how was the experience? Well, you want the long story or the short story, but I'll give you the, the, the short story. Uh, 15 years ago, I was, uh, I was looking to China as, as a new destination for exports for Austrian Grüner Berliner. So I organized a trip to see the te- top 10 wineries of the country. And um, in this capacity, I met uh, on my first day, it was Chang Yu. And uh, after I concluded my trip of 10 days, I, I came back to Chang Yu and said, these is the guys I really would like to work with because they, they were uh, the oldest and they had one thing which I think was really cool. Um, their first winemaker ever in the 100 and then 115 years of history was an Austrian. And I'm Austrian too. So I said, this is a good omen. And ever since I work with the same people uh, with great pleasure, I'm learning from them. And it's a big inspiration for my life. You before worked in a different country and you work in the USA. And what, how does it differ in the, the market within China? It must be. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I consider myself extremely lucky because I was European born, born and raised, educated uh, even with Latin and Greek because my father insisted on this humanistic humanistic education, as we call it. And um, of course, I learned English and French as well. Um, but um, at, uh, at a certain stage of my career, I left Europe for working with Robert Mondavi. Um, and this is something which I, I, I'll, I'll never, ever forget, because I know the family for 30 years, the Bob Mondavi family. And um, they taught me so many positive things of California. It, because California is not the U.S., as you know, um, but it's this positive spirit, this, this why worry, don't worry, uh, you, yes, you can, and all this stuff, um, and solution-oriented. And I think this is the biggest achievement in my 10 years of, of California, where I really learned how to deal with, with problems and to solve them. And then, I mean, 15 years ago, uh, then came China. And consider this. The uh, U.S. is a very, very new uh, civilization, modern civilization. They have ancient the Mayas and Incas and so on. Yes, that's very old. But, um, uh, and then Europe is, is not that, re- that old because the Romans were around 2,000 years ago, the Greeks 2,500 years ago, but the Chinese have a history of 5,000 years. And I, 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 before you ask me, I'll tell you right away, I did not master the language yet. Uh, and the writing. So I have a huge respect for this country because people who speak and who write this language cannot be stupid. So big respect because I wasn't able. I was told it's that tough and I will never give up. 
But um, this alone is already um, a point where, where people should have a second look at China. And um, well, how is does it different? In, uh, like, because obviously the the, mar- the local market is very different compared to other country. Is, is it has it been difficult to adapt to it? Um, yes and no. Um, um, I, I when I talk to to my grandfather who is no longer with us, but my father is still with with us at the age of ninety, um, and he traveled to China as well. Uh, he started 14 years ago, so I was I was one year earlier, and he's also in the wine industry, still is, and, and he said China is basically in its infancy when it comes to wine drinking, because mind you, the per capita consumption is one and a half liters per, per head or two bottles um, spread through all of China, but in essence, it's 50 to 60 million people in the, in the larger cities drinking wine, as we all know, so it's it's, it's, it's developing because 30 years ago, nobody drank wine. They have a history of winemaking and wine drinking for thousands of years, but that was only nobility. And the, the first, first commercial winery was Chang'e uh, in 1990, uh, sorry, 1892. So the history, and this was the first one, yeah? So the history is relatively limited, but really it started 30 years ago and therefore Whatever we experienced in Austria and Germany after the war, that's what I can find in China. So I'm familiar with what's happening, but the market is developing rapidly and that's very good. And, uh, and, what, and uh, obviously when you decided to join Shanggu you, with your project in Nixia, what, what made you choose this region? Uh, I was again lucky because Mr. Zhou, then the CEO of the company, now he's the chairman, he, he, he said in 2009 already, Lens, where would you go if, if you would uh, have a chateau named also after your family? Because Moser 15 is my name and 15 generations of Moser family in the wine industry. And uh, I said, give me a couple of weeks. I uh, got, uh, got on a few, few flights and, and checked some territories. And uh, Ningxia was what well, got the prize from me. Because um, there's one thing as a winemaker, I found the smallest uh, Cabernet Sauvignon berries I've ever seen in my life because it's desert climate. So it basically doesn't rain. It's relatively tough climate. The good news is we have warm days and cool nights. So we, we keep the freshness and the small berries protect themselves against evaporation because during the, during the growing season, there's practically no rain. And so it was relatively easy for me to decide and I was lucky because now everybody talks about Ningxia and um, we are there already. And it, yes, it's one of the most, uh, as we say, most invested in region in uh, all China. Yes. China is still uh, like, how, at what stage do you think is like in fine wine production? Yeah, that's a, I, this, this is a good question and, and, and the answer will, will be maybe a little bit stunning for you. I think uh, we are again in our infancy, but give you an analogy. When I visited Napa Valley in, in, as a student in, uh, in the early 80s, it was maybe 10, 15 top wineries at the time. Today we have 800 wineries in Napa and maybe 150 to 200 really good ones. And, and, and the same is true for, 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 for Ningxia and for, for the greater China winemaking. We have maximum 15 top wineries at the moment. So uh, to be amongst the very best in China, I have to say at this very moment is relatively easy. If you are a seasoned winemaker, if, if you have uh, state-of-the-art equipment and, and, and grape varieties, and, and well, we have only Cabernet Sauvignon, but still, um, this, is, this, is, this is the challenge. The real challenge is to, to, to belong also in the company of the world's finest, because this is our second goal. So amongst the very best in China, um, and, and, and um, I think we achieved that because uh, a few days ago, Chances Robinson wrote in, in her article about China, and she mentioned only three wines. This is Ao Yun, the most expensive wine made by Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. It was our, my new uh, uh, icon, Purple Air comes from the East, and the Summit from Silver Heights. And so that shows you that there's interest, um, but it's still very, very limited. 
זה, איזה תהיה small uh, niche, איזה תהיה niche, and, uh, yeah. and obviously you're focusing on export and try to be anywhere in the world that will be found uh, on many places. And when he, well, what make you choose uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon grape as a, as a leading grape? Uh, good question. I didn't choose anything. That's all I have. So when I came five years ago uh, to the winery, then I, I, I just found a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, we, we, have about, we, we get wines from about 100, 250 hectares. And basically all of it is planted with Cabernet Sauvignon. We have now a few parcels with Merlot. Marcelin and, uh, and Syrah, but that's it. There's no whites. And therefore, uh, I have to live with, with what I have for, for the moment. Yeah, the future will be different, but you know how long, long it takes if you plant the vineyard and if, if, you, if you want to, to make a wine from this vineyard. And, uh, and that was the, was, do you make one of the most unique wines in the uh, probably in China and in all the world, you make this white Cabernet Sauvignon. What was that the reason for it and how do you make it? The reason, again, was very simple. I needed a white for, for Europe. But as it turns out, I needed a, a white or whitish wine also for, uh, for China because the youngsters in China, especially young women, Um, when they study abroad, they, they are exposed to other wines as well than red wines. So when they come home, they want something like this. And especially since uh, the Blanc de Noir from Cabernet Sauvignon, our white Cabernet, has a DNA of Cabernet Sauvignon, which is very popular in China. So we, we get along with this, one, with this wine very, very nicely. So it, it was built or born out of necessity. This was it. And how do I make it? Um, uh, easy. Give me 20 minutes, senier from, from, from the crusher, um, two valves. So, so we split, uh, we split uh, into the white wine tank, in, into red wine tanks, and then you have a win-win situation because it makes my red wines better because of 10% more concentration. And as a byproduct, I get... I get the white cabernet, so uh, it's a very, very happy combination. And uh, you, you recently released a second label. It was like um, oak age. How, how, how does it differ to the regular one? Well, we thought white cabernet uh, stainless steel is not crazy enough. Um, no, that's the joke. But uh, we said, why not try? to age this wine in, in small uh, wooden barrels from France, the Paris, the usual ones, um, new ones. And uh, all of a sudden, during a year, I travel five times a year to China. So every two or three months I, I, I go there and every time the wine got better. And after one year, we got so excited and we had only about a thousand bottles of, this, of the first release. And this is the one you know. Um, and we got so excited that we said, okay, let's bottle this and show it to, to some of our friends around the world. They got so happy. So uh, the next bottling is underway. I think next week from now, we are bottling this, the, the second vintage, 2018. And this will be 18,000 bottles. Uh, so I can play with it because the demand is there. People are happy with it. And it gives a second a second character of this wine. It's much more complex. It's, it's like, like um, a nice burgundy, if you like, aged in wood, not too much. But after all, the wine can take the wood because it, it has been one year in new oak barrels. So it was aged for one year in new oak. And when you taste it, it gives a lot of complexity, which I love in wine. And obviously coming from Austria, white wine, it must be part of the DNA with yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and when it, when it comes to Nixinia, what, what are the risk of the region? Is, uh, is any particular problem you find in the region? Uh, the risk is, is max is, is, is absolutely zero. Uh, apart from one hardship we have, we, we have to bury the wines. 
we have to uh, make sure that the, the frost is is not damaging the vines because we have every winter we have more than minus 20 uh, degrees Celsius. And as you know, the grapes are, are basically dying from, uh, from minus 17 onwards. So that's why we have to bury the vines. So uh, what we have there is, is ideal growing conditions. So there's practically no risk from, from fungus, from disease, from, from animals, from bugs, from, from worms, whatever. So it's a, it's a very, very happy combination there. And it's, it's also home to the first uh, wine appellation of China, where um, Ele Montans, and you have some couple of wine produced in there. How, how is it defined? What is, uh, what is about it? Is it different? To... Well, basically, uh, basically the region is, is, is a long stretch of about 120 kilometers long. Uh, going uh, ranging from north to south and is protected by the Helen Mountains to the west, to the northwest, I should even say, which is great because we are at 1,100 meters altitude. The Helen Mountains go up to 3,000 meters. And especially in the winter when uh, the, the, the strong winds from the west and from the northwest come from Inner Mongolia, because Mongolia is not too far away, only 500 kilometers, we are being protected. So that's why the hill and mountain range is very, very important for us. And um, our two uh, first wines come from the red and the white, come from the hill and mountain regions. This is very, very close to the mountains, this area. Although close to, we are also very close to the mountains because we are, the winery is about 10 kilometers away from the mountains where the mountains start. And the, the vineyards for hill and uh, mountain range about five kilometers away f- away from Helen Mountain. And um, basically, the, the the region you I was reading is compared to like Mendoza and a bit of Napa Valley. And uh, how 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 do you retain it? Do you tell you know about the small Cabernet Sauvignon grapes? How does it differ? How does it differ to any other region you visit? I have been to to California about 70 times in my life, especially to Napa because of the Mondavis. I've been to Mendoza a couple of times, but uh, Nietzsche is completely different because it's super dry. Because in Napa, you have a lot of humidity during the night with the fog. Uh, Even even in Mendoza, it's the same altitude. Um, It's much hotter there. And despite the elevation, you don't have the cooling off effect during the nights. I've been there during the nights. It's even hot during the nights. Uh, but since we are so continental, uh, we have this continental climate in, in Ningxia, and therefore it's so much drier. And um, the two elements which I really love in winemaking is the small berries. This is very important for me because that gives you as a winemaker the opportunity to, to extract or not to extract or to do more with the wine. Yeah? So you have more in your toolbox number one. And since I'm, I was tra- born and not born, but I was trained in Bordeaux. And therefore I go for the freshness and the elegance in wines and the drinkability. And therefore, um, I, I really love this region because it gives me the freshness with the cool nights um, and, and the hot days. This is good, but my, it, we get less than 20 degrees during the nights, even in, in, in the summer, like now. That preserves the freshness. This is the top. Small berries and the, the, the cool nights is a very, very important thing for me. And there's a, that during a range, obviously maintaining the acidity helps uh, a lot. How does, uh, how do you find it for uh, the vineyard management? How, what sort of practice are you doing and you, I think? This is, uh, this is my Achilles heel. heel. Uh, or I should say it was my Achilles heel because the first three and a half years of making the wine there, I had to do it from vineyards, which are not perfect because it's so, so, so incredibly tough to find proper vineyard management in China. Everybody wants to make a good wine. Everybody wants to be the seller and be the winemaker, but nobody wants to go out and make a good vineyard. But I'm... I'm, I, during my career, I have learned 
that the quality is, is really coming from the vineyards. Because I'm old enough to know that in, let's say, 30 years ago, uh, the winemakers were the big stars, you know, the flying winemakers from all over the world, because they could turn even shitty grapes into decent wine. And this is possible, yes. But if we talk about a fine wine, the paradigm has really shifted away uh, from winemaking rather to wine gardening. And, and, and therefore, it took me two and a half years to get a proper vineyard management manager for the Chateau, Mr. Joe, a super guy. He's one of the best people I've ever met in, in China. And I'm really happy that he joined us. And it shows already in the 2019 vintage at the Chateau, which gives, gave us completely different wines, much, much better because the vineyard was, was taken care of, the leaf management was okay, um, and everything was just perfect. Yeah? And uh, you were saying earlier about the, the burning of, of uh, the vines. How does that work? Uh, the burying is very simple. Uh, it's it's uh, In the winter, it's it's done... So basically we prune in November, so we do the cuttings and everything, and then we, we, we bend uh, the vines down, and then the tractor comes with the plow and, and, and just shovels the whole earth and dirt on top of the vines. So it's about 30 centimeters, 35 centimeters on top, and that's it. The only thing is in, in, the, in, the, in the spring, we cannot unbury also with the tractor. Everything has to be done by by hand, otherwise we would hurt uh, the, the, the vines. And what's very special, in Europe, we have the vines up, up, upright, 100%. And in Ningxia, we grow the vines like this, like 45 degrees. So when we bend them, we only have to bend for 45 de uh, degrees. So the, the, the trunk doesn't break. Oh, okay. So some, it was developed to, to do that. And it's something may think thought before. And the... When we're talking about cold winter, uh, it leads me to the another part of the Xangu portfolio that he makes some ice wine as well in a different part of the, the region of China. Well, what is it? And uh, I know there's something quite interesting about it, the numbers. When... Um, China, when China does things, they do it right and they do it at scale. So about 20 years ago, uh, a little bit before I went to China for the first time, the, the leaders, the leaders of, of Changyu got together and said, well, how can we impress the world market with, with what type of wine? They found the category of ice wine. And so they, they um, worked together with Stephen Miller, who is a Canadian, to double the ice wine production of the world practically overnight. In, in planting a vineyard, one single vineyard, um, north of North Korea, where it's always very, very cold in the winter, uh, for 350 hectares. And, and this basically was, was uh, the big bang in ice wine production globally, because China is a very, very important ice wine market. Meanwhile, we export also because it's very, very good quality. It's done from the Vidal grape, because the Canadian brought his own grapes with, with him. And it's a super premium product and everybody's happy with it. And I have tasted it a couple, a few times and it was always been very good as the wine of Shangu Moza. What was, uh, what do you see the future of the Chateau? Where, why do you like to be in 10 years? The future, the future will hold uh, one thing for sure, because we just completed our first five year cycle. In the first five years, I tried to, to stabilize the winemaking and to get decent wines. And, um, and, and even, in, even in the first five years, I can prove that in four vintages, I could increase the quality, except for, for 18. This was a weaker year because we also have vintage variations. Um, so we couldn't increase the quality. But 19 is a definitely a blockbuster. 17 is a blockbuster. 15 and, and, uh, and 60 were also very, very good. So um, the, I, I just tried to make a decent wine and, and try to get to know the region, the terroir, the people, my competition, etc. cetera. Uh, in the second round now, um, and this is, was a little bit difficult this year because usually I would have traveled to China in May and in July, but obviously COVID-19 with two weeks of quarantine is not so easy. Um, so I will only go for the harvest, but 
the winemaking team and myself, we are working on innovations because I said now, now we know the terroir, now we know the region, we know our vineyards, now we can go on, on more inno innovative ideas in terms of winemaking. There's not going to be a revolution, but we'll, we're, we're going to do quite a few things from the vineyards uh, during harvest and definitely uh, in, in the fermentation process as well. And this, uh, you try new experiments, you concrete eggs, I imagine, all this sort of thing. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's a way of concrete eggs. Uh, this is not my thing. Um, I'm, I'm conservative. All I need is a stainless steel small fermenter, uh, temperature control, that's it. Yeah? Um, no, but we, we are doing a lot of things in the vineyard. I'll give you one example. Um, the morning sun, especially in the warm climate, is gentle. It's not as hot. And the, the, the afternoon sun is brutal. So what we're doing in the vineyards, because we have our rows all north-south, uh, so we, we, we de-leaf the eastern-looking uh, um, parts of the row and um, leave most of the leaves on the western side because we have to protect against sunburn. In the past, we did de-leaf everything, which was not a great idea, but this is now showing you the, the, what we're doing is paying more attention to detail. Because when you talk to my friend Axel Heinz from Onelaya and ask what is the difference between making a, a good wine and a fine wine, he will tell you, um, he will tell you immediately it's paying attention to detail. And that's it. Yeah? This is it. And, and details is uh, one more example because it's really, it's something I would like to do as well. <clears throat> When I met him last, it was, I think, 18 months ago or something, he, ca he just came away from a pruning seminar, so wine pruning seminar. And I said, how long did you spend there? He said, a week. I said, oh, my God, how, how, what do you do a week? And he said, it's the philosophy of, of the wine tree because uh, he changed his paradigm completely on, on pruning because every time you cut, you hurt. It's like if you cut here, you hurt. So the vineyard or the, the vine tree is hurt as well. So what he is doing now is he is minimizing the cuttings in pruning. Just a little detail, but the, the vine stays healthier. And that, that, is, that is all about fine wines. It's the last little detail. It's not quantum leaps anymore. It's paying attention to detail. Forgive me for, for elaborating, but I think this is very, very important. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. It's something very interesting and uh, I think it's very worth listening to it. Um, what about for just a couple of questions? Where do you think is uh, the greater China wine production is going to be? What is the trend? So what, what do you think they're going to be? When you look at the, the trend and if you look, look at the data, and I was giving a speech at Wine to Wine uh, last November, and I was shocked to find out that for the last seven years, Chinese wine production and Chinese wine consumption has been going down. Um, despite the fact that everybody said the wine is the, the market is booming, yes, the, the market was booming until eighteen, almost no, 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 it's two years, eighteen months, two two years ago, um, because it, the, the fact that Chinese production was going down was disguised by exponential growth of exports or imports into China. So China was growing crazy on the import. Ten years ago, the import ratio was 20%. Uh, last year, the import ratio was 50%. So from 20. So that, that's tectonic shifts in the market. But also last year, interestingly enough, export or imports, I should say, imports were, were losing ground as well. So the market flattened. Nobody really knows what happened. My take is, and that's a brutal one, is that quality, uh, be it from China or from the imports, was not good enough for the Chinese consumer in terms of a price quality ratio. Because wine is relatively expensive in China and therefore the consumer shies away. And the second factor, if you permit me saying, is uh, Baiju. This industry is about 10 times as big as the wine industry in terms of value or dollars. Dollar Value uh, has done a fantastic job in, in marketing their product to the Chinese consumer with enormous marketing campaigns, which the wine, as you know, doesn't have the funds. So these are the two reasons why wine is 
is has been slowing down quite a bit in the last two years. But the good news is um, the youngsters want wine in China. The young generation like you, they, they are well trained, they are well traveled, they want to enjoy the good life. And as you know, the good life uh, and wine goes together extremely well. And for a fine wine, especially for quality, they're looking for more quality wine. So and fantastic. And uh, Lance, before I go, just um, well, obviously you focusing on export and in the UK you are imported by Bibendum. What other country are you, are your wine, are wine available? Uh, our wines are available now in 25 countries in Europe and 15 countries outside of Europe. And we are expanding um, this year, hopefully, from 40 countries to 60 countries. Right? Despite of COVID-19, we're making very, very good progress. Fantastic. Well, Lance, th thank you so much for your time today. And uh, once again, uh, today was uh, Lance Moser of Chateau Shangu Moser 15. And thank you so much for all your insight on China and all your wines and Ningxia region. Thank you very much indeed and thanks for your time and for your interest and thanks for, for sort of um, uh, exporting our story to the rest of the world because we need friends, we need to shout a little bit because I know nobody is waiting for wine from China, only if we can tell a story and expose our wines to taste uh, with the consumers. So thank you very much. You join the conversation with Lance Moser on Looking Into Wine. If you enjoy learning about Chateau Shangu Moser 15, I would suggest the book The Chinese Wine Renaissance, A Wine Lover Companion. You will find the link for the book below. As always, be sure to go on matiascarpazza.com and remember to join our mailing list now to receive the latest news and projects that are coming up. If you like the podcast, please give us a 5-star review on iTunes or Podchaser and tell your friends to subscribe. We are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartMusic and every major listening app, as well as at mattiascarpazza.com, where you can find and listen to podcasts earlier. A special thanks to today's guest Lance Moser, music produced by Samuele Dinardo, audio edited and mastered by Tommaso Ascoli.